Good morning. Um, and perhaps welcome to those few attendees that I think are with us on this session from somewhere where it isn't the morning. Uh, but obviously you are in the UK town hall uh, for the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries. So uh, I think for most of you, uh, it is still early on a Friday. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, I'm Annette Spencer. I'm the Director of Public Affairs and Research um, at the IFOA. But this morning, uh, my job is going to be to put your questions to our panel. Uh, so I'm going to introduce the panel in a moment, but I did want to just take a couple of minutes uh, to say a little bit about the format for this morning's session. So we're going to run this uh, as a straight question and answer session. There are no speeches or anything of that sort uh, because we want to try and get through as many of your questions uh, as possible. And I have been provided uh, with some questions that a number of you have been kind enough to send us in advance. Um, and I'm gonna kick off the session uh, by trying to, to work through some of those advanced questions. But we are really keen uh, to get your real time questions while you are in this session. Um, so we would like you to be able to submit your questions as we go along. Um, to do that this morning, we're going to use the Q&A function um, that you should be able to see somewhere on your screen. On mine, it's at the bottom of my screen. Um, and you can just click on that uh, and, and write in the question that you want to send. Uh, we're not using the chat function. Um, and we're not using the raise hand function this morning uh, in order really just to keep it simple so we can look in one place for your questions. So if you have a question, uh, please uh, submit it through that uh, Q&A function um, and, and my job will be to try and get us through as many of those as possible um, with the panel. So um, I have been doing some thinking about the correct collective noun for a group of presidential team members and a chief executive. And I have concluded that they can only be a wisdom. So this morning's wise men and women uh, on the panel today, we have our current president, Tan Sui Che. We have the president elect, Louise Pryor. We have the immediate past president, John Taylor. Uh, and the IFOA's Chief Executive, Stephen Mann. Uh, so with all of those kind of formalities um, and, and introductions over, um, Suiche, if you're happy, um, I'm gonna dive us straight into the first question. Uh, great. Great. So um, in your presidential address uh, in summer, and indeed on a number of occasions since, you have talked about how the actuarial profession needs to change and adapt for the future. So in your view, what is the future of the profession? Uh, thank you, Annette. Uh, I, I just want to say hello to all my friends in the UK and elsewhere. I'm calling in from Singapore. Uh, one of the joys, and I'm sure my presidential colleagues uh, and Stephen Mann would agree, uh, is uh, of, a, of being a president is to be able to engage with members. And of course, COVID-19 changed all that. Uh, but I'm very pleased to be uh, with, uh, with many of you here, nearly 200 uh, from the UK and, and elsewhere. Uh, I, uh, Annette, uh, coming to your question, um, uh, the future is uncertain. I, I can't tell you what the future is uh, of the profession, uh, but I can tell you what the vision and the strategy of the profession and I, IFOA uh, is uh, if you are successful, yeah? I, I think three words came to mind, yeah? Influence, um, uh, relevant influence and impact. Relevant and influence and impact. Uh, firstly, at our workplace, at our workplace. And the other one is in our industry, largely financial services industry and the world at large. Uh, and, and, and the workplace, it speaks to our ability to respond to the fast changing world of digital revolution and the fourth industrial revolution. And that was what our strategy really spoke to, data science, machine learning, multiplinary solutions. And the second one, uh, speak to our public interest. And, and I think in terms of public interest, uh, we cannot uh, uh, but accept and embrace the issue of sustainability. Uh, because we call ourselves actuaries and risk professionals. So I can see ourselves doing, uh, being relevant 
influential and impactful uh, in the way in a world of doing well in terms of fulfilling careers, but in a world in a world of doing good as well, in the world of sustainability, uh, in a world of uh, uh, making our voice count uh, in, in a larger scheme of things. Yeah. So that's how I see. Uh, the future of profession. And as I said in my presidential address, it's contingent on two things, uh, on a cultural transformation of IFOA, but also on the way we are able to, the profession at large, able to change our mindsets, yeah, uh, to one which is, uh, uh, in a, uh, to one which is more di uh, diversifying, yeah. Thank you, Suiche. I think that's been a great way to, to kick us off and, and, and a, a clear answer uh, on the future of the profession. Louise, I'm going to turn to you next, if, if I may. Um, we've had a lot of different questions, uh, understandably, on the subject of COVID-19, all kinds of different angles. So um, I think I'm going to start uh, by asking you to tell us um, a bit about the IFOA COVID-19 Action Task Force, or ICAT, as we prefer to call it. Um, and I think people would be interested to hear how it came about, um, sort of what was the genesis for it, um, and also uh, kind of bringing it up to current times, what sort of outcomes and outputs are we starting to see from the ICAT group? Could you help, please? Yes, thank you, Annette. Only too happy. The difficulty is going to be keeping it brief because there's so much going on. Um, ICAT, and I'm very glad that Annette reminded us what it stands for because I often forget. Um, we started it basically to try and bring together the activity that was going on. Um, sort of back in April, May, we had some uh, practice boards starting off working groups that were related to the pandemic and so on but we thought that there was it was better to to try and bring everything together because there's a lot of work that that is useful for int and interesting for actuaries to do that isn't particularly linked to a single practice board we also wanted to provide space for more rapid reaction more informal outputs than was available through the traditional working groups. And um, as part of this, obviously, we were partly inspired by the um, actuaries response group, which was an informal group of actuaries that got together to provide very, very rapid reactions to what was going on on the pandemic front. You can find um, them on LinkedIn and they are doing some fantastic work there. But we thought that we needed something just a bit longer term. So we put out a call for volunteers. We now have over 580 volunteers from 49 countries, which is fantastic. We have up to 93 work streams. I say up to because some of them have finished, some of them really never got going. Um, it's all a bit fluid. Um, so, well, I say so far, about two weeks ago, we'd had 76 outputs, including 52 blogs from 27 work streams. Um, one of the things we're trying to encourage is a more sort of rapid and informal way of doing things. So a lot of um, blogs, their articles, their webinars, we've got an interactive website, all sorts of things going on. So um, many thanks to all those volunteers, actually, who are doing such fantastic work for us. Great, thank you, Louise. I think it has been amazing, the, the response and the energy from our members uh, around this. So it's, it's really quite incredible. Thank you also for a very succinct summary of what I know is a lot of different activity that is going on. Um, I'm just going to pause to remind people to please do send your questions through. I'm starting to get a few questions coming in, um, but, but definitely please use that Q&A function and send me some more questions, please. Um, John, I'm going to turn to you next, if I may. I'm going to switch topic again uh, into uh, thinking about our exams. So obviously back in the spring, uh, we had to, uh, in a really rapid space of time, uh, move from doing our exams in the, the kind of conventional way, in person, in a classroom type thing, uh, to moving everything online. And then we did that again for, um, for the September exams. Um, so I've got a couple of questions that have come in on that. Uh, one is how successful do we think the online exams have been? 
uh, and also a number of people interested to know whether we will be reverting back to the in-person exams when the pandemic is, situation is over um, or whether we think we'll stay online with exams. Thank, thank you Annette and uh, hello everyone. Yeah, I mean, it's if, if we kind of try and imagine back to the, the world prior to the pandemic, uh, early this year when the education team and volunteers were setting up to run their usual diet of uh, conventional exams in, in April, then all, clearly the world was turned on its head and within a, a very small number of weeks, they were able to repurpose uh, those exams to offer online exams to most students. We couldn't run every exam uh, in that format, but we were able to do so uh, for most of the exams. Uh, so those students who've been learning for months uh, were actually given the opportunity to, to sit an exam at a time when other bodies were, were having to cancel the entire diet. So I, I do think it is worth reflecting and paying tribute to an executive team who um, have shown tremendous agility in responding so, so quickly to unprecedented events. You know, a time when you know, commercial organisations uh, 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 have struggled to respond quite as quickly. So a big, a big thank you uh, from me and the rest of the presidential team to the executive and the volunteers involved in that. Now, that was a, a very rapid response and there was still a degree of uh, you know, learning to be taken uh, out of the, the April exam. So for example, the questions were set with a, an offline process in mind. And they didn't always lend themselves well to uh, being responded to in an online format, with example, mathematical formulae. So with all of that learning, we had much more time to prepare for an online diet uh, in September. And so we were able to run a, an entire suite uh, of exams this time uh, devised specifically uh, for an online format. And that's been tremendously successful. I think we had over 23,000 papers sat um, in September, giving all the students the opportunity to, to sit exams and at the same time maintaining the high standards uh, that uh, we expect of ourselves and our stakeholders expect of the profession. So I think overall it's been a, a tremendous success and kind of emboldened by that, uh, I think the plan is very much to continue um, on that basis, even once we get through the pandemic and everyone's uh, vaccinated, the online exams will be the, the main uh, mechanism. And if I can just very quickly talk about some of the longer term developments, the Education Front has also been very busy in terms of broadening out the offering to support the vision that Sui Che was referring to earlier. So in the last few months, we launched the Data Science Certificate, and as a quick advert, there are places available in the, the January uh, sitting, um, so do, do yourself a favour and give yourself an early Christmas present and book on that. Feedback from early delegates has been, has been superb, um, and we're actively working on uh, extra support for you know, banking actuaries uh, and indeed for, for climate risk. So I think uh, we're broadening out uh, the uh, education offering, and that's only going to continue. So watch this space. Great, thank you very much, John. As again, a, a very good sort of cans around what is quite a broad subject, um, and, and uh, as you say, a lot of rapid change this year. Um, there's a couple of kind of follow up, perhaps more operational questions on exams. So, Stephen, I think I might uh, might pose these couple of operational questions to you while we're on the exam topic. Um, so, we've had um, a question uh, which is really I think asking in a sense why does it take so long for students to get their results so there's a kind of three month lag between people sitting the, the exams and getting their results could it be done more quickly um, and a, a sort of related question which is that because we've not been able this year to run the wonderful events that we do for our new qualifiers. I, I've been to a few of them and they're lovely occasions. Um, but a question about whether we might revert back to publishing our new qualifiers in newspapers as a way to acknowledge their achievement. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> hello, everyone. Just on uh, the exam turnaround, actually, it's a really good question. I mean, with online exams, as John's described earlier, we get the papers earlier. Uh, which is fantastic. Uh, but the process of marking the exams is manually intensive. We have every paper needing to be marked by two, sometimes three of our examiners. They then go to the examination board for moderation. 
uh, we then have to weave in um, uh, uh, feedback from our exam platform as to whether there might be cases of plagiarism or collusion or other uh, elements. So making sure that we protect the integrity of the exams with that sort of heavily manual process is the blunt reason it takes so long. Uh, we do have a plan to try and speed this up. Uh, clearly, as the exams develop uh, on an online basis, as John said, uh, there is the opportunity to introduce more multiple choice um, questions, which I think will, will make the examination answers uh, less variable. Uh, and in time, we do want to see whether we can automate more of the marking. Uh, and I think when that becomes possible uh, we should be able to get the exams out a little earlier. Uh, this is a very good question about uh, shouldn't we just publish out the names in the Times. I think we're going to have a fantastic event next year uh, for, and catch up uh, for our newly qualified so, so that is definitely something we're thinking about. Uh, we took the decision earlier this year not to publish the names in the Times and that was simply because we're custodians of our members money and it was costing £30,000 a year. And I think we have to think very carefully about whether that's the best use of our money. I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the question, uh, but obviously we have to balance a whole range of different priorities and we just couldn't really justify it in the current climate. Thank you, Stephen. I hope those are really clear answers. Um, I think for um, I, I, I imagine our student members, uh, in particular, who are are asking those questions. Um, and I certainly want to make sure I'm there for that big double celebration event for the new qualifiers next year. That sounds great. Um, Sweet I'm gonna. I'm sort of staying in the world of learning a little bit, uh, but I'd like to come to you to talk about um, CPD. Um, if I may. So uh, we've had some questions in about that uh, because of the change to the scheme that came in in September this year. Um, and uh, the questions that we've been asked are, um, how can fellows in particular um, ensure that they make a success uh, of the new scheme? Uh, and uh, also we've been asked what kind of reaction and feedback have we had from members about the changes? Uh, and also a question about uh, whether we are going to be a bit more lenient, that is the word the member used, a bit more lenient um, around the CPD requirements this year because of the changes and the problems of uh, doing CPD while they've been managing the pandemic. So could you pick up those kind of CPD questions, please? You're still on mute. Thanks, Annette. I just want to reframe uh, two words, yeah? Uh, lenience, because I, I don't think it's about leniency, but it's about ownership, yeah? Because that was the most powerful word I heard in the debate uh, when we talk about CBD and also our new learning strategy uh, for BSMD, yeah? Uh, because there is an assumption that if you fill up the checklist of uh, papers read or seminars attended, you have learned, yeah? Uh, and I met a, a, a group of uh, senior directors who say that actually uh, they don't learn anything from those seminars, they learn it from elsewhere. So, so, so attending an event or reading something doesn't mean that you learn. But learning is really about, uh, it's a very personal thing and you've got to take ownership of that. And the whole CBD philosophy is about asking uh, individuals, uh, actuaries, uh, to do uh, a reflective piece uh, on what they have learned in, in, a, in a variety of forums and there will be peer review and, and, and conversations around that. So it has become a less checklist, but rather uh, a process where they uh, can demonstrate they have uh, uh, learned something. And that goes into the heart uh, of our strategy as well, because it is not just CBD in isolation, uh, we want to be less focused uh, on qualification and examinations, but those are still important because standards are important. Uh, because examinations uh, and qualifications only give you a certificate, but on qualification is the beginning of a lifelong journey of learning. Because knowledge is changing and updating itself so quickly, uh, and, 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 and we're living longer lives. What we learn at the age of 25 is not going to be so relevant at the age of 40, especially in a digital world. So the whole mindset, uh, it is about uh, taking ownership of your personal learning and development. Uh, I have people who are very enthusiastic about new schemes. Uh, the new scheme, there are people who say that they actually prefer a more structured one. Yeah, so, so it's a bit mixed. Yeah, 
But a structured one, I, I think it's a question of changing the mindset. It is not about fulfilling a checklist, uh, but rather taking a, a, a responsibility. Uh, you, you have a supplementary, right? Uh, about something else. Uh, was there a supplementary? Uh, so, so, um, so I think that that, that, that was probably, are we going are we going to be you said lenient is not the right word but I think there was a kind of follow up question about whether we will will assess things in a different way. I think the terms of the scheme is that there will be random conversations. Yeah, and it's not about assessment, but rather to ask people what they have learned. Yeah, so some kind of process is still required. Yeah, uh, I, I, I think we we should not think of this as lenient, but really encouragement of people to take ownership for their own learning. Yeah. Great, just unmuting myself. Thank you, um, Sweet Che. So I, I think that hopefully that's answered um, at least some of those questions that members have got around how the CPD scheme is, is going to be working now. Um, I'm going to flip us around again. I'm just trying to cover as many topics as I can. Um, and just a reminder to people, please do keep using the Q&A function. I'm getting a good steady, steady stream coming in now. Um, so that's great. Please keep them coming. Um, John. We have had um, uh, quite a few different kinds of questions uh, on data science. Um, so I thought I might invite you, you obviously gave a, a small trailer earlier um, for the upcoming session of the credential, um, but I thought I might invite you to just tell us a little bit more about uh, the progress in data science uh, generally for the IFOA. I know it was a big initiative in your presidential year, so it would be good to hear how that um, it, it is going. Um, and some of the questions that we've had, the specific questions are, are kind of around what other opportunities might there be for uh, our actuaries to, to widen their skills and domains knowledge, um, and also what is the pathway if someone who's maybe starting out in their career now wants to kind of move into these new technologies and data science, how do you sort of see uh, that kind of pathway for maybe a student member now um, who is thinking about that kind of career? Thanks, Annette. Some, some great uh, questions embedded in there. And I think, you know, it's great to hear the interest that, you know, is already there for, for, for many members, but I would probably encourage maybe nearly all members to be, you know, finding and learning a bit more about data science. I don't think we will need, you know, all actuaries to become practicing data scientists, but, uh, you know, data is becoming so pervasive, not only in our traditional industries, but beyond that uh, being, you know, literate in what data science can do to support actuarial work, I think is going to be increasingly a, a prerequisite um, for actuarial work. So I would encourage um, you know, the vast majority of actuaries to try and find out more about the, the art of the possible um, in that area. And um, to do that, I mean, we've talked already about the, the, the certificate, but uh, there are um, a number of other resources available to um, members. So if they go into the learning and development part of the actuarial uh, professions website, we'll find a, a curated list of courses that uh, people can attend. And um, many of our events also have a, a strong data science focus. So for example, um, I chaired a member interest group um, for banking in terms of the applications of data science there. So many of the, the webinar sessions uh, will, will bring to life some data science applications. And as a, as a kind of trailer uh, for, for future activity, um, I know Stephen and the, the rest of the team are looking on ways that we can you know, foster closer links with um, the, the data science community who may not all be actuaries, um, and so that we can uh, improve the dialogue and get greater cross fertilization uh, between the, the two. So I'm kind of very encouraged by the, the steps we've, we've taken in it and the appetite from, from members, but uh, I think that's only going to grow over the coming months and years. Thanks, John. It seems like there, there's a, a lot of opportunity um, in, in this area for, for our members who do really want to, to engage with it more. Um, so um, we've had, uh, I think, a really uh, interesting question in very, very broad. Um, so I'm going to give Louise this challenge, at least initially. <laughs> um, and the question is, uh, basically, what is the IFOA doing uh, in, in diversity and inclusion? Uh, what are we doing both for our members and also for the employees at the, at the IFOA? Can you help? Um, 
I hope I can help on it. Yes, um, we, we've had a diversity policy since about 2016, um, and we've had a um, group called the Diversity Advisory Group since before that, I think. We're, what we're doing now is we're updating our diversity poli policy and the diverse, the, the DAG as it's known, the Diversity Act Advisory Group is now called the Diversity Action Group. So we are shifting very much, um, we're shifting our focus to um, basically make sure that we do stuff rather than just talk about it. And we have a goal that um, our on the um, executive side, we have a goal that the makeup of our staff, our employees, should reflect the communities that they are situated in. So that's obviously on all sorts of dimensions. We're also very keen. We realise that there are that we have increasing and i'm talking about the uk here i think specifically rather than worldwide our commitment to diversity is worldwide but many of the specific actions we're taking i'm just going to focus on what we're doing in the uk um we recognize that the diversity of new entrants to the profession is not as great as we would like to see there are people from various backgrounds that for one reason or another do not feel the actuarial profession is for them and we want to change that. So we do have a very good um, program that goes out and talks to prospective, to, talks to um, school students and university students of what about being an actuary is about and where um, we've recently shifted that or increased the emphasis within that program on looking at people from much more diverse backgrounds and trying to help them. We also have started talking to employers about this. We recognize that there's to a certain extent only limited work we can do as a professional body because in, we, we don't employ the students, it's the employers who employ the students. So we're reaching out to employers and talking to them about how we can work together to increase the diversity within the profession. Um, I think that's probably about it. There's a lot more I could say, but I know we need to keep it brief. Thank you, Louise. I, I, I'm sure we would all agree it's a really important uh, area um, and one that uh, the profession's not unique in the challenges around it, but it's good here that we are, are really trying to look at how we can make a difference in that area. Um, I thought I might just ask a quick follow-up um, actually of Stephen um, uh, because it's a, a, a you know a sort of related subject but um, I know um, that you have been uh, quite engaged in thinking about the issues that arose out of the Black Lives Matter um, kind of issues and awareness um, that, that has arisen during this year. So I wondered if there was anything you might want to add just a little bit more specifically on that to, to complement Louise's answer. Uh, only, only two things that uh, IFOA has a zero tolerance for any form of uh, prejudice, bias or discrimination. Uh, that's a message I've been very clear uh, communicating internally. It's one that we would wish to convey very clearly externally. Uh, I think we've tried to avoid uh, sort of leaping on the bandwagon with lots of what might be superficial responses to the really important matters raised by BLM. Uh, the approach that Louise has suggested is, is thoughtful. Uh, we have had a number of blogs uh, from the leadership team to talk about the importance of taking things forward, but we have got a very clear appetite internally uh, about what we want to see. We've got to come up with a very considered position uh, about how we support the benefits of a globally inclusive profession. That is work that we're committed to doing in Q1 next year, and I'm looking forward to sharing the results of that with our membership more generally. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, on, on that. It is such an important subject. Um, I'm going to stay with you, if I may, um, uh, just uh, just for a moment, uh, because there is uh, one subject um, uh, that has really generated a lot of questions um, uh, in advance of the session as well as, as in the session. And that is, of course, the subject of events. Um, and so um, there are lots of questions I could ask. I'm going to just give you a handful to begin with uh, to see if you can answer some of them. So um, we've been asked how successful um, have the gyro and the life conference 
conferences been this autumn where we've had to convert them from the usual in-person event uh, to being fully online. Uh, do you think that we will see a continuation of more virtual events after the pandemic situation or will we go back to being mainly in person? Um, and perhaps the most important question of all, uh, the one that fills our, our post bags the most, uh, do you think it is appropriate that we are charging for all or most of our webinars? Uh, thank you, Annette, and some, some really good questions there. I mean, I joined IFOA as your CEO back in January, and we had a, an events programme that looked quite different to where it is today. It was a lovely mix of face-to-face uh, -face events, online events, uh, some were free, some were, were, were charged for. Um, IFOA never seeks to make any money from events as a whole, uh, but when we put together the income we get, we aim simply to ensure that, they, that we cover our costs. Obviously, um, with the advent of, of COVID in uh, March this year, we've not been able to run any face-to-face -face events, and substantially it has been our face-to-face -face events which have subsidised the running of, of the other costs. So we were faced with, with two, uh, I think, very immediate decisions to take then. One is a recognition that we needed to massively accelerate our online uh, event offering, uh, and that has worked extremely well. I'm delighted with the feedback I've uh, seen from the LIFE and Gyro conferences. We've had record numbers. We've had record global reach, which I think is something that we wouldn't have experienced before. So I think all of that has been good, and we've had record attendees. The other sort of more knotty issue is that we have and decided to subsidise the cost of running events, given the loss of face-to-face -face events this year. Uh, and um, where we have sought to recover costs uh, is where we think it is fair and appropriate, and we have only sought to recover what are called our direct costs in running those events. So that would be the cost of the platforms, the moderators, the marketing, and so on. And just to put that in, in wider context, since March, we've had over 22,000 bookings for our online events. Over half of those have been provided uh, free. Uh, the others have had some, some flat charging to try and cover the, uh, the direct costs that are related to that. So what that's meant is that our decision has been to subsidise either fully or very substantially all events this year. And that has come at a cost to IFOA of around about 1.3, 1.4 million. Uh, and we are beginning to think about what does this mean uh, moving forward. I was quite struck with the feedback from the gyro conference with the significant majority of delegates. Uh, we're encouraging us to look at more of a blended, more of a virtual online event for next year. We are going to take a step back uh, and think about what platform we use, our approach, and taking the lessons from those events to see what approach do we need to take moving forward. And we will think very carefully about the right way to look at that uh, in Q1 next year. Thank you, Stephen. I, I know it's a subject that we could fill the whole hour with. So uh, thank you for, for trying to address at least some of those questions um, uh, as briefly as you can. Um, I'm uh, going to move to one of our live questions that we've had um, come in. Um, and I know it's one that John is going to definitely want to, uh, to, to address. Um, so uh, someone has uh, said that they're very interested in the work we've been doing on the Great Risk Transfer Project. You might want to explain what that is, John, in case we have any members um, on the session who, who are aren't familiar with it um, uh, and really uh, the question is just inviting an update on where that work is at and talking a bit about why it's so important. Thank you Annette and thanks to I think it was Kit for the the question there. Yeah so the, the, the great risk transfer has been a kind of thought leadership initiative from the IFOA that's I think resonated strongly with uh, members within the profession and indeed stakeholders outside and what it speaks to really is at the intersection of public interest and the actual aerial profession's core competence in managing financial risk. And what we've done is taken a little bit of a step back and tried to look at some of the, the big uh, tectonic shifts in financial risk. And actually, probably the, the, one of the biggest trends has been a shift of risk being shouldered by institutions like you know, governments, employers, and institutions to them being more on the shoulders of individuals. And I think we're only too familiar with the mechanisms. So defined benefit contributions, uh, pensions to defined contribution, freedom and choice, making annuities less popular in favor of drawdown. And even data science is talking about uh, insurance risks being 
uh, very granularly priced, if I can say it, um, potentially meaning that it becomes unaffordable to, uh, to individuals. So, so we're in a position now where individuals are bearing far more actuarial risk uh, than they did decades ago. And so we're kind of calling out the theme um, and trying to look for remedies in there. It might be very hard to swim against or arrest any of that tide, but there are opportunities that we're looking at. So for example, collective defined contribution is a, a great way of uh, you know, developing a new pooling mechanism that would share risk uh, between cohorts. We're also looking at ways of helping those individuals uh, to make better decisions. So, for example, you know, I've been quite heavily involved in my day job uh, um, on robo advice, and that's actually taking, you know, actuarial modelling and trying to make it consumable by individuals to help them make uh, better financial decisions. So, I think this is uh, probably some way to to run for as an et, and I would encourage all those members who are interested in the theme and think they have value to add, because I think the initiative itself is probably going to spawn a number of follow-on initiatives so that we can make a difference in the policy arena and indeed to individuals who are having to, to manage those risks. Great, thank you very much, John. I'm sure that's been an, an excellent introduction for those who didn't know about the work and, and a great kind of update uh, for those uh, who obviously from the questions are very enthusiastic about it. Um, right, um, I'm flipping uh, back over to Louise now, um, if, if I may. Um, we've had quite a few questions um, of various sorts um, on the subject of sustainability and climate change. Um, and I know there is, again, a lot of activity going on in, in this area. So um, I wondered, first of all, if you could maybe give us one of your lovely potted summaries of all the different things that are going on uh, with the IFOA um, in, in that area. And particularly also, uh, we have had a question uh, about the uh, curated reading guide on climate risk. So if you could uh, steer people to where they can find out more about that, that would be great. Thank you, Annette. Well, we've had the... Um... Resource and Environment Practice Board, which has recently changed its name to the Sustainability Board, that started in about 2013, as I recall. So we've had a lot of activity going on, obviously before that, but certainly over the last seven years or so. And that culminated in September with a big report going to Council about what the IFOA should be doing about climate related risk and Council accepted that report. So we've now got masses and masses of activity going on both within the executive and the volunteers to make sure that climate related risk is seen by all our members as a major risk of the same sort of seriousness, if you like, at the, at the heart of what actuaries do in the same way that interest rate and mortality risk are. And as part of that, we obviously need to support our members in learning more about climate risk and how it can apply to their work. So the sustainability board is doing a fantastic amount of work on that. There's a whole series of practical guides for actuaries in various fields. Um, just type in practical guides into the search box on the website and that'll get you there. We are also developing, as, as the um, member asked, um, a curated reading list for um, sustainability issues. That I don't believe is ready yet, but when it is, the um, Sustainability Board will um, doubtless be publicising it as much as they can. We're also in the process of looking at developing a credential in this area, so that'll be something that a more structured learning than just sort of self-directed learning is uh, something that members can do um, to bring themselves up to speed. That'll be sitting be out that oh sorry that will be sitting outside the exam structure to start with. There's also a lot of member-led research going on. So for example, we've just got a new working party just started on um, zoonotic disease risk. Um, diversity, biodiversity loss increases contact points between people and wildlife. You get pathogens spreading over. That's um, a source of pandemics, for example. So we're going to be looking at that. And there's been many other interesting, much, a lot of other interesting stuff going on. Do look at the volunteer page for the sustainability um, volunteer call. 
that's probably all I have time for. But if you asked me, I could go on for several hours more. <laughs> I'm going to ask you one quick follow up question because I don't know if I, I don't know if you touched on it in, in that, that comprehensive summary, uh, but are there plans for the IFOA to move to um, a, a, a zero carbon target? Oh, yes. Yeah, no, you're quite right. I did forget the, one of the most important things, the cherry on the cake, as it were, is that the IFOA will be issuing a comprehensive statement on climate risk. Um, I'm hoping before Christmas, it's just being finalized. And as part of that, we will be making a commitment to a zero carbon, a net zero carbon um, outcome for the organization. So basically watch this space for that. Great. I had, I'd, I'd been hearing that there was lots of work going on in, in, in yeah. that area. Yeah. So I, I thought it was a, a good follow up question to ask you. And I know that it's going to be a, an increasingly high profile topic as we move into next year um, with, with COP26 and, and so on. Um, Stephen, um, I'm just going to come back to you, if I may. Um, I think it falls to the chief executive to sometimes get to the uh, perhaps the more tricky questions. Um, so we have had um, a couple of questions in uh, wanting to understand what the financial impact of COVID-19 has been on the organisation um, and, uh, and what, if anything, uh, members might see change as a result of having to address that. Um, and we also um, have had a uh, um, a sort of two-part question that says, how have the IFOA staff been coping with uh, COVID-19? Uh, so that's uh, quite a thoughtful question, uh, but also asking if it has had any uh, detrimental effect on services to members. So I wondered if you could pick those up, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I'll start with the, the finances. Um, I mean, the simple answer is that it's largely netted itself out. Um, and uh, uh, that's not to say it hasn't been a roller coaster to get us there. So if I just briefly explain some of the things that have gone against us. I, I touched on events earlier. Uh, the loss of face-to-face -face event income has had quite a material impact. Uh, on exams, we've had to uh, invest in a new platform, but obviously we had sunk costs relating to the um, exam centres that had previously been booked and committed. And we've obviously had to uh, very appropriately extricate ourselves from a number of commercial contracts, uh, which we weren't going to be able to fulfil, uh, given the impact of COVID. And I think we've done that extremely uh, well. And so those have been the sort of the big negatives. Uh, the things that have gone for us as a direct result of COVID is clearly people are travelling less, uh, which is good. Uh, we closed the offices pretty quickly uh, back in March and we've been able to make some savings uh, there. And we have also taken, I think, a very appropriate but limited uh, advantage of the government furlough scheme uh, here in the UK. So those sort of things have been out with our control. Uh, the things we have focused on uh, that have helped hugely has been a very intensive focus on cost management and making sure that we're spending money only where it's really necessary. Uh, we have been um, quite strict in terms of uh, colleague pay reviews, bonuses, and those sorts of things as those have played out. Uh, we also, and I quite like having a plan which is reasonably sensible, so our assumptions were, were, were reasonably cautious heading into this year, and I think uh, we've had some favourable variances to those assumptions. Um, the impact for members, I think, is that we have also been able to accelerate elements of the strategy uh, as a consequence of this. I think a good debate on events and seeing how those might look differently in the future. We've touched on uh, online exams, but we've also recognised the absolute importance of delivering on the vision of IFOA so that we have begun to push those things through and we expect members to see uh, more benefits of that coming through. I think thank you for the question on colleagues and I think they've done a, a fantastic work. Uh, many of you um, will know for your own work environments, it's felt like it's been three years in one. People have had to do replanning and more replanning. Uh, and I think uh, like uh, many of the people, uh, many of the people on this call, I think they're probably a little bit fatigued. I, I do think uh, they are uh, really pleased to be able to show some tangible outcomes for members, I think. As John said earlier, we were very concerned about our students in particular uh, in April. So to be able to put on exams has been really helpful and to see such positive feedback and record number from events coming forward. So I do think there is a, a link between all of this well-being of colleagues, delivering members, the delivering meaningful results for our members over the next 12 to 18 months is going to be really essential. Thank you, Stephen. I, I, I'm sorry to give you the the, uh, the operational question uh, questions, but I guess it is your role. Um, Sweetay, 
Um, I'm, I'm going to kind of move us back to, uh, in a sense, where we started, uh, which is actually, you know, the future for the actuarial profession um, and what our members really need to be thinking about. And I know uh, that uh, that uh, since your uh, inauguration uh, and even as recent as this week, uh, you have been publishing and, and promoting a lot of information about the reinventing of the profession. So I wondered if uh, you could share uh, with with everyone who's who's on the on the call um, just kind of the sorts of activities that are going on and where you see that work going you may I guess want to talk also about things like the thought leadership work we're doing um, and that sort of thing so it's a kind of general invitation to talk about reinventing the profession you're on mute uh, thank you Annette uh... I think the simplest way uh, perhaps to think about it is that uh, this is not uh, uh, something which we thought of and wanted to do, but it's really in response to the, to the world around us. Yeah? And it began three or four years ago uh, with Marjorie who wanted to talk about uh, the future fit uh, and, and all that, uh, digital and all that. And, and, and really the world was changing in 2017, 2018, 2019. It was about a digital revolution, about the fourth industrial revolution. So VSMD, which is the current the, the strategy was really a response to things happening in our workplace. Uh, and I think that is how firmly taken root. Everybody is uh, fully in support of that. Uh, and, and we know that it's not just about learning about data science, it's about our mindset, uh, which has to be more innovative, has to be more entrepreneurial, have been more curious and adaptable. Messages which we have got from all the, pre all the presidents, many presidents in the last 30 to 40 years. So that, that is the, the first part, which is about thriving and securing our future in our workplace. Uh, and then I call that the do well, yeah? Uh, it's about us having sustainable careers. Uh, and I, I, was sit I was sitting next to Luis about four years ago or five years ago in Hong Kong, when the first risk alert uh, came out on climate risk. But at the time, uh, it was important intellectually, right? And even until one or two years ago, uh, it was not so visceral. But things really changed. Uh, maybe 18 months ago, and of course with COVID-19, uh, the context changed deeply, deeply. Uh, so when we voted on the climate risk report, it was a unanimous vote. Uh, uh, in September by the council, yeah, because council is a very diverse group. And, and this speaks to the space of our public interest. And, and we still have diverse opinions, but we want IOA and the profession to be a compelling voice in public interest. Then we've got to figure out how to express that voice. Yeah? Uh, so, so that is really important. But, but I think that we are beginning to find that voice. Uh, it is about us uh, uh, in the context we live in, uh, it is about us being risk professionals. And by definition, risk professionals have to be interested in sustainable systems. And increasingly, we realize that the problems we have is not within the system. It's actually systemic risk, which is outside the system. So a new mindset is required for us to, to be bolder, uh, to venture into that space. Echoing the first president of IOA, uh, Ronnie Bowie uh, from the faculty, and also Reddington, uh, who, who talks about uh, imagination uh, and, and courage, right? So, so that is about the world of sustainability. So the reinvention of the profession is really about how we think uh, uh, about ourselves as actuaries uh, to survive and to thrive in the digital world. And the other one is how we express our public interest uh, in a way which is meaningful uh, and in a way uh, which adds value. John talks very passionately uh, about risk, risk transfer, right? It's our job just about pricing uh, and doing, uh, uh, or do we have a view about risk being transferred to a lot of uh, individuals? Yeah, is that a good thing? Uh, it's it's quite, a, quite an important issue. If our products are opaque, uh, is that okay? Yeah, but we also have to bear in mind many of us work for commercial companies, so we got to respect that and manage also our public interest voice uh, in, 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 in a very measured way, in a very measured way. So, so, so I think these are big issues uh, which, we have to, which we have to speak to. Yeah, so I, I've sort of okay, come to the end. 
Thank you, Sweet Che. I, 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 um, I am going to do a little trailer uh, on the back of what you've just been saying, um, because I, I know that this week we have published a, a lot of kind of new material and in particular, I think some great videos um, that are really kind of the next stage uh, in us talking about uh, this, this kind of evolution and the transformation uh, for the profession. So uh, for those members uh, who, are, who are on this session, if you haven't yet had a chance to, to go and look at those, um, I might be giving you some some weekend viewing, uh, which is do, do go and take a look. They're not long, uh, but I think you may find them quite quite, quite interesting in the context of what Suiche uh, has has just been talking about. Um, Louise, um, we've had quite an interesting um, COVID question come in, um, I, and I, I wondered if you might be uh, be able to to talk about this one. Uh, so our member is saying that obviously uh, there can be quite a lot of misinterpretation and miscommunication. I think sometimes the word is misinformation um, about statistics uh, in, in relation to COVID. And so it seems like there has never been a, a better opportunity uh, for actuaries to display your skills um, in, in this area. Um, and, the, and the questioner says, obviously, the task force is producing a lot of really great work. But is it generally available to the public? And and what are we doing to make sure that we raise our profile um, in terms of our, uh, the actuarial role in all of this uh, with the media and with government um, uh, and just kind of making sure we take that opportunity? Would you yeah. like to talk about that? <laughs> Another big topic. Thank you, Annette. Um, um, there's several things going on here. One is that the Actuaries Response Group is actually doing a fantastic job of putting out on um, LinkedIn and Twitter um, analyses of many of the statistics that are coming out and they produce their uh, analyses very rapidly. Um, the CMI, the Continuous Mortality Investigation, which is sort of part of the IFOA, is also putting out regular updates which analyse the um, statistics coming out from the OMS, I think, the um, Office of National Statistics. It's also, I mean, I do think it's important here that the IFOA is doing things, but also individual actuaries can do things too. We're seeing a number of actuaries quite active on social media um, commenting on these statistics. And I think that's extremely helpful, especially if you have the word actuary in your description somewhere. It's up to all of us to do, to do this. We also have, um, as part of ICAT, we now have a group a work stream that is assisting the UK government's um, scientific advisory group of experts or SAGE and they're working um, not on statistics directly but on supporting SAGE by critiquing some of the models that are out there and um, how what, what reliance SAGE should be able to put on them. Um, so there is an awful lot of stuff going on some of it is under the, the, the covers, as it were. So, for example, the advice to SAGE is by its definition not in the public domain. Um, all the work produced by our ICAT work streams is online through the Pandemics Hub on the IFOA website. Search for Pandemics Hub and you'll find it very easily. So there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, if people, I, I do think there is work we can do and we are doing, um, your team, your comms team is doing a great job of, of, of publicising some of this stuff, but it's also up to individual actuaries if they have things to say, to, to say them, because that can only increase the credibility of the profession as a whole. Thanks, Louise, and thank, thank you also for the compliment to, to the team. Uh, just to let members know as well, the Pandemics Hub is in the public section of our website. It's not uh, behind the member section. So if you do want to encourage your non-actuary friends to, to find out more about that, that is freely available, as well as all the things that Louise said. I know that, um, Suiche, I think you also uh, would, would like to add something on this. Yeah, I uh, because uh, as Louise speaks, it, it, it resonates with me. Uh, and I wanted to go back to the space uh, about influence and thought leadership uh, of the profession over the last 30 years. Yeah? And I, I alluded to that in the presidential address. And, and without being uh, 
uh, disrespectful to any generation. I just sense, from my point of view, as I came uh, get engaged, there seem to be they're, they're less, um, uh, uh, they're more inward looking. Uh, I, I think we can be more courageous, right, uh, as as a body. Uh, and as actuaries, and I think it could be a throwback to the Morris Review, and and, and and therefore we were trying to get our house in order or whatever. Uh, but I think it's time for us to because things go through cycle. Uh, it's a good time for us to go back to cycle, especially when there are so many issues which speak to our expertise. There's no shortage of good material uh, in, in IFOA, you know. If I look at, uh, but it's how we bring boys to those material, how we bring boys. And I spoke about uh, that somehow thought leadership has lost its centrality. Yeah? So it's about where it's placed. Yeah? So we still have sessional meetings, but the sessional meetings I attended in the 80s uh, and in the 90s uh, was really quite big affairs. You know? uh, <laughs> actuaries come from consulting bodies. They are rivaling one another in terms of audiences. There's a council meeting. There's then a, a paper. Then there's a dining club. You know? and, and, and Many of the council members uh, were themselves writers of papers, yeah. Uh, so somehow, but but we had become international. There was a world of fifteen hundred people, right? Now we have a world of fourteen hundred people, uh, uh, increase of nightfall. So we need to do both well, yeah. Uh, so I think that in partnership with Louis and Stephen and and Annette yourself, we we come out with a program, and that is trying to bring thought leadership more central. But it's not just a one year job. It got to be continued, right? It got to be continued over time. Uh, and thought leadership has been advocated by by Colin Wilson uh, about three or four presidents ago. Great risk transfer, which was uh, also a very important theme of our time. Climate change by Louise Pryor. So next year, uh, starting next month, actually, uh, we are going to have speakers like um, Andrew Scott, uh, who, who authored a book, Hundred Year Life. We we'll talk about digital and the increasing long life. What institutions and individuals can do. Uh, we are going to do a COVID-19 uh, seminar. We have um, Sir Adrian Smith, who is the next president of the Fellow of the Royal Society, who is going to speak about mathematical futures. He speak about uh, what we are doing. Uh, and, and people like John Kay uh, and um, Andy Holden, who is the chief economist uh, of Bank of England, who speak to the issues about the integrity and the efficacy of our financial and regulatory systems, right? Uh, uh, but but this doesn't change the world, but it can start a conversation, yeah. And we got also our internal expertise experts who can be engaged uh, likewise. So hopefully, uh, we could have some kind of cascading impact uh, from 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 all these initiatives, yeah. Uh, Sweet Jay, thank you. you uh, I think we've done a great job in this session of giving our members lots of trailers and pointers to all kinds of activity that we're doing or is coming up. Um, so, so thank you very, very much for that. Um, I'm keeping a very close eye on the clock. We really only have a couple of minutes left. So I'm going to ask a final quick fire question. Uh, so no more than 30 seconds each. Um, uh, and I'm going to ask this to all of the panel. Um, so it's a final kind of COVID related question. Um, in this uh, strange, unusual, I think the word is unprecedented year that we have had, what is the single biggest thing that you each have learned? Stephen, can I come to you first? Uh, yes, and it is, it is that Donald Rumsfeld was right. <laughs> um, and I'm going to assume that our members uh, either know that reference or have access to Google. Uh, so thank you very much. I think that's a great learning. Uh, uh, John. Thanks, Annette. Yeah, I'll try and squeeze in a couple of things. One, the, the world of the possible is far bigger than we thought. Who, who would have thought, for example, we could have put all exams online within a very small number of weeks? So let's keep that radical vision in mind. And secondly, I think one of the things that's made me proudest to represent this organisation, just the reinforcement of how relevant and important the profession is. We've heard about actuaries at the front line of COVID-19, but those doing the bread and butter supporting um, insurers and pension schemes have made sure, sure that those organisations have been resilient through unprecedented market volatility, in turn giving confidence to the, the savers and consumers that we ultimately serve. And that's a, a wonderful thing for us to be proud of. Thank you, John. Everyone was nodding uh, on the panel as you said that. Uh, Louise. Never believe anyone who says that could never happen. And also, 
what if this pandemic we're going through is in fact just a near miss that there is another one coming up with higher fatality rates or more um, higher more, being more contagious this is not the worst it could be and we're risk professionals so, so Thank you. BJ, last word to you in 30 seconds, uh, uh, writing on Stephen Mann's uh, is about context. It has, context has changed to one of volatility and uncertainty. Uh, so, so context has changed and we must respond to the context. And I think the word which comes to my mind is reflexivity. Uh, we've got to be able to vary our response yeah? and, and not necessarily look for old formulas. Yeah? We, we need to think of the right way to respond to a very changed world. Thank you very much. That seems a very good place for us to end. It just remains uh, for me to thank uh, the uh, the many hundreds of members um, who have joined us for these sessions this morning. Thank you very much for, for taking the time and particularly those of you that sent questions through to me. Uh, and of course, on your behalf, uh, for me to thank the panel for their candid, uh, candid answers and being willing to take on a wide variety of topics this morning. So thank you very much. And that is the close of the session.